Well, I was a cub reporter covering that interop, interop conference. Uh, uh, and so, I, uh, you know, at the beginning of my career as a reporter, I went, I covered networking. Wow. Which, which confused almost everybody in my family. They didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I imagine that might have been true for people outside of your direct, you know, colleagues. Absolutely. I tried to explain to people what I was doing and they would look at me like I was crazy. I mean, yeah. you know, computers are these things and air conditioned rooms and why would you interconnect them anyway? And blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I want to it... fast forward to today, uh, uh, Vin, and, and ask you, um, you know, we're in it. It certainly feels like another significant inflection point uh, for the internet as a platform, as a set of technologies as, that are interconnected, broadly under the, the, the header of, of artificial intelligence. Um, it feels uh, to me, uh, as an observer of the space for 35 years, that it, that it might be similar to other milestones we've seen you know, over the years. You named uh, you know, graphical user interfaces or the World Wide Web. Others have said it's as significant as the iPhone. But when I asked you this question earlier, you had a, a really interesting answer. So I wanted I wanted to prompt you to, to, to give it to me again, which is how big a deal is this? Is there a, a moment in the history of computing uh, that is as significant as the one we're in now? I absolutely believe so for a lot of different reasons. And let me let me put this into two pieces of context. One of them is the Internet itself and the applications that are running on it right now. For many years, John Perry Barlow's uh, you know, beautiful uh, vision of an open Internet where everybody shares information with each other and we all sing Kumbaya. We clearly know in 2024 that the situation is a little more complex than that, that there is harmful behavior on the network. It's amplified by various and sundry applications, including social media, among others, and that we have to do something about that. Nation states are starting to recognize that. They're trying to pass laws. There are international treaties. I just got off the phone with an hour of discussion about a cybercrime treaty that the U.S. is representing the American position on. So, uh, so it's well recognized that this system is, I, I won't say out of control, but I would say that there is increasing concern about the potential hazards and harms that this online environment uh, creates. So that's one kind of state of affairs. The second thing with regard to the uh, state of computing right now, for many, many years, uh, uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Dave Patterson and uh, John Hennessy, who's the chairman of the board of Google, in their independent their roles at Stanford and Berkeley came up with what's called the reduced instruction set computer, the RISC design. Mm -hmm. And that is, has been the workhorse of the design of computer chips for years and years. We have reached a point now where specialization and heterogeneity is our friend and we are, we are deeply dependent on specialization in order to achieve increased gains in computing capability. What does that translate into? Well, in, at Google, it translates into having a variety of computers in our data centers, conventional central processing units, specialized graphical processing units, uh, tensor processing units for specialized inference uh, in uh, machine learning. Uh, someday, maybe quantum processing units. We're still trying to make these things function in a useful way. So, so we're, we're seeing a transformation in computing capability and type of computing, type of problems that these things are uh, well adapted to solving. That's super exciting. The uh, large language model aspect of machine learning has triggered yet another highly speculative um, view of what uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence can do. Uh, the problem that we have right now is that the way it does it is predictable. And in fact, you hear terms like hallucination, where factual material is con conflated into counterfactual output by these uh, extraordinary programs, uh, you know, machine learning mechanisms that, um, that are not yet reliable for all possible applications. So uh, it, this is a super exciting time for almost anyone who's interested in computing and communications to say nothing of the fact that, uh, that we have more access to internet than ever, thanks to the uh, Starlink and other uh, low earth orbiting satellites 
in addition to the mobiles that we carry, which are also increasingly capable, uh, as, uh, as is uh, things like Wi-Fi in people's homes, buildings, public facilities. This is a time of enormous, uh, uh, I would say, a potential. And uh, I'm quite excited about the rest of this decade. Yeah. And could you compare it uh, to a time in the history of compute? Would you say uh, it's comparable to the dawn of the web or more comparable to the dawn of prog prog programmable computers themselves? I would say that the, the dawn of programmable computers uh, is sort of, this, that's where we, we are, that was the beginning of an enormous uh, period of, uh, of elaborate uh, invention and development. Software is sort of the ultimate clay. There, there's no limit to, to it. Uh, it's only limited by your imagination and ability to program. Uh, so uh, we're at a point now where we have more diverse clay than we ever had before. We have more capacity than we ever had before, both in terms of scale, transmission data rates, uh, computing power, memory, and everything else. So uh, from my point of view, uh, the sky is the limit uh, for, for new applications of, of these kinds of devices. So I'm as excited in this period as I would have been, I think, in the earlier time uh, when computing first rolls out in commercial form in, say, the 1950s. Yeah, well, that's a that, that's a, a date that that hasn't come up much. The 1950s, in, in, in when people think about the history of the internet, um, I, I want to ask you to sort of reflect on what you think the greatest impact uh, on democracy and and how we govern ourselves has been of wow. these technologies. Well, you know, many of us had hoped that democracy would be in, enhanced. Uh, as a consequence of the internet's existence and all the devices that it can service, our ability to reach information at our fingertips, which I still think is astonishing. I mean, I was sitting at a dinner party last night in a fancy restaurant. A question came up. Somebody pulled out their mobile and did a little Google search and got the answer. And, you know, there we are. And, you know, 50 years ago, you would never imagine it was possible to do that. You get up and, you know, run off to find the Encyclopedia Britannica to get answers. So the fact that we can do that is still very remarkable from my point of view. However, uh, we're also faced with all of the potential hazards of misinformation, disinformation, uh, the fragmentation uh, of discussion uh, into these uh, uh, what do you call it, confirmation bias uh, vacuoles. And it is uh, the groups of people that believe in certain things and the, they only look at the evidence that reinforces that belief. It creates polarization. Uh, there are, and to say nothing of all of the various uh, real harms that take place, whether it's uh, ransomware or malware or denial of service attacks or other kinds of uh, fraud and abuse and everything else. So we are in a, a fairly... Um, uh, contentious environment right now and the natural reaction is to try to get control of that somehow so that's why you see a lot of legislation being passed and debated and dis discussed i worry that we don't have a depth of understanding of the dynamics of all this technology that uh, would inform our choices of legislation and law mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if you pass a law can you can you actually enforce it Right. I have to tell you, back back in the uh, I, probably early part of the 20th century, probably in the mid mid parts of the 20th century, uh, there was a, a little French village that had a lot of vineyards, and and the the mayor decided to have a law passed that said no UFOs were allowed to land in the vineyards. <laughs> so 50 years later, they had a great celebration that the law was effective that no UFOs had landed in the vineyards in the past 50 years. Uh, this is a classic uh, category error on, on the part of the legislators. So we still lack, I think, a, a, a firm understanding of what kinds of laws make sense and how they'll be enforced. Uh, and we were I, discussing it earlier, Vin, you, you, you mentioned something that I wanted you to unpack. When it comes to thinking about how to create uh, legislation, um, say, on the impact of artificial intelligence on society, you said you advocated for um, 
focusing on use and not on the technology. Yes. Themselves. yes. Can you say a bit more about what you mean by that? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, uh, this came up in the context of artificial intelligence and machine learning and the large language models. Uh, these are startling uh, inventions. Uh, some of them do things that we never imagined they could do. Uh, for example, one of our uh, colleagues at Google uh, had uh, just presented uh, a prompt to a chatbot saying, please reverse this random string of characters, which it did. And then it said, oh, by the way, here's the Python program that does that. Now, none of us were expecting it to go write a Python program. And it worked. So there are things that these uh, complex systems can do that we didn't anticipate. The, the problem is that we don't understand this deeply enough to write rules about how they run and how they work. The better tactic, in my opinion, is to say, well, what are people using these for? If it's pure entertainment, that's fairly low risk. You know, you, you ask, give it a prompt, it produces. I asked it to write a story about an alien that got into my wine cellar and was surviving on my Cabernet Sauvignon. And it wrote <laughs> a little story about a Martian who'd gotten into the wine cellar. Uh, and that was, I considered that to be innocuous. Now, there are arguments about the use of these technologies for generating entertainment, which might run into some intellectual property problems. For example, if you use a famous person's face or voice or whatever, uh, without their permission, there are some questions about whether you should be allowed to do that or not. But setting that aside, the, the entertainment side is relatively innocuous. But as you start working your way up the risk factor layers, when you get towards the top, you're talking about financial advice, medical and diagnosis and medical treatment. The last thing in the world you should do is use a chatbot to get advice about investing unless there's some evidence that the party who put that thing together has actually taken significant steps to prevent it from giving you bad advice. Right. And of course, I'm not sure you now what evidence you would offer to say that you, you know, protected against that. Right, other than perhaps that organization's willingness to take some liability, I suppose. Well, yeah, exactly. And so that raises really interesting questions about who's liable for what, it's just like the argument about when the self-driving car runs into something, who's liable? And I don't right. think we have good answers to that yet. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of the discussion around these topics of how do we regulate, should we regulate AI, tend to focus on the negative case. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you how you think these new technologies might help us uh, be better uh, citizens, better uh you know, uh, at governing ourselves, uh, how can AI strengthen democracy? Well, oh boy, that's a good question. Uh, again, the, the worry that I have is that if, if you use a, uh, an artificial intelligence large language model to get qu ask questions and get answers back, uh, the problem that I foresee is that you may not be uh, confident that the answer you got back is valid. And so we still have a lot of work to do to uh, find a way to verify that the, the output from this bot uh, has validation and has, you know, what is the provenance of the information that it used in order to co uh, compose the answer. Uh, just to give you an example of the trickiness here, I asked it to write a, a, um, an obituary for me, thinking that that was a well-defined form, that it would have encountered obituaries in the course of uh, imbibing uh, much of the uh, World Wide Web. Uh, and uh, so it, it did produce an obituary, and it, the format was as you would expect. We were sorry Dr. Surf passed away. It gave a date, which I found slightly unsettling. Was it in the future? Yeah, yeah well, yeah, but not far enough. <laughs> so uh, so then and then it, it produced a rendering of my career but while it was doing that or when it did that uh, it gave me credit for stuff I didn't do and it gave other people credit for stuff I did which was disappointing and then when it got to the remaining family members it made up family members that as far as I know I don't have so the problem we run into uh, is that uh, if, if we would like to use these as important sources of, of information that we use to exercise our democratic rights to vote, among other practices, uh, we really need help figuring out whether or not the information we get back uh, is, is valid. 
And of course, a big problem that humans have is that confirmation bias is quite natural. If the thing comes back with stuff that I believe in, even if it's wrong, uh, you know, I'll accept that. So uh, we still have work to do uh, to figure out how to make these kinds of systems produce reliable and verifiable uh, output. Uh, my one of one of my favorite uh, I mean, scenarios here uh, is that uh, if you ask uh, a question and you got back an answer, you should be able to ask more questions about getting validity. Like, how is the in, what information was used to compose the answer? Can you show me the websites that might have been sources of content? Uh, how can I, uh, are there any corroborating assertions from sources that I would trust? So there are a bunch of things that I would wish that we would do. Now, a lot of people don't want to do that because it takes work. And you know, really, it's, it's an illustration of critical thinking. Yeah. When you yeah. ask, you know, where does this stuff come from? Is there corroborating evidence and so on? So uh, I now believe that critical thinking may be an important skill that we should employ in order to make use of these advanced mechanisms in our uh, pursuit of democracy, but we need to be smart about the way we use the data. Well, an audience member just mentioned that he, he, he's tried that with ChatGPT and it made URLs up. Um, and and I, I do, I, it, it is interesting how Google, where, where you now you know, hang your hat, um, <clears throat> really was built on this citation, almost academic citation framework. Uh, the citations were links, of course, and you had to be careful about whether or not you believed what was on the page that was linked to. Absolutely. But and it, therefore, least... you needed critical thinking, right? Yeah. Um, but but this has been a problem so far, the opaqueness of, of these systems. And, and I think that's what you're referring to. And I, I'm, I'm a big supporter of figuring out how we can get you know, more well, transparency into the system. As, as do I. I mean, people need agency in order to exercise this critical thinking. So this, the designs of these systems need to take into account a desirable property, which is that it is capable of responding to you by telling you what the provenance of the content is. And you can then decide, perhaps on your own, whether or not you accept the provenance as as, uh, as uh, an indication of uh, accuracy of the, of what comes back out. Yeah, yeah. So well, I'm I'm back. Sorry, just just to suggest something, I, I harp on this critical thinking thing all the time, and I finally realized that you could boil this down to an internet driver's license. <laughs> you know, and think think about what we do with teenagers. We we run them. We insist that we run them through these training programs, and we show them what car crashes do, and you know, to people and to property and so on. Uh, we warn them that other drivers are less competent than they are, and they should drive defensively, and all this stuff. We even give them a test before we give them a driver's license that lets them drive the car. Now, I'm not arguing that the people should necessarily pass a test before they can use the internet. But I do think the kind of training that we do to help people be safe on the road could be an analog of that, could be uh, helpful to people who are going to use the internet so they are aware of the risk factors yeah, and how to cope with them. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's sort of illiteracy, if you will. That, that, In that, a sense, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I want to uh, ask you a, a question then, and there's sort of a follow-up that I noticed from one of the uh, esteemed members of the audience, Esther Dyson. Uh, oh, yes. Esther is a dear friend, so I'm yeah. glad he's listening. Um, and uh, I went to Esther's conferences for as, as many years as I possibly could. Um, but the, the first question I have is, um, if you could go back uh, over the last 30 or 40 years of, of internet history and sort of maybe land time travel and land somewhere, and <laughs> change a set of uh i'll let you get that <laughs> well it will ring two more times all right well if you could change oh it's a politician asking for money normally <laughs> i hate the russian and they hang up <laughs> If you could, if you could, if you could go back in time and change something that maybe a decision that was taken or a path that that was embarked upon, as it related to something in the internet's structural or technological or social history, what might it be? 
Well, the first obvious one is that I would start with 128 bits of address uh, space instead of 32. But I can just imagine, you know, my 80 year old self whispering in the ear of my 30 year old self, you're going to need 128 bits of address space. You know, my reaction back then would have been, are you out of your cotton pick in mind? That's more than there are electrons in the universe. And, uh, and of course, at the time we went through some reasoning and said, you know, for development purposes, the 32 bit address space should be more than enough. Uh, we, we, and we're not going to have more than, say, 256 of these experimental networks anyway. And if it ever did get out, you know, that's two per country. That ought to be enough for competition. And then we allowed for 16 million computers in each network. And at the time, 1973, computers were these big, honking big pieces of equipment in air-conditioned rooms, and they didn't get up and run around and so on. So I don't think that I would have been able to sell the idea of 128-bit address space at the time that we were right. doing. Right. So, so even if I believed what I was hearing from my 80-year-old self, I would have had trouble selling that. Some people have said, why didn't you put more uh, you know, security into the system? Uh, and uh, once again, I don't think that would have worked very well. Uh, the people who were designing, building, and using the system were graduate students for all practical purposes, and they, they are not the first cohort you go to uh, to find uh, disciplined use of cryptographic keys. <laughs> or, you know, they get distracted by homework and final exams and dissertations and so on. And so uh, even though I was working with the National Security Agency on secured versions of the system, uh, using link and end-to-end -end packet crypto, which, by the way, we had to invent packet crypto in order to get this to work. Uh, that was not a scenario. That was a scenario that made sense for the Defense Department, but it didn't make much sense at the time that uh, we were doing the development. Now, today, that's a whole other story, and you notice that people who use the World Wide Web almost exclusively use HTTPS for end-to-end -end cryptography to protect the integrity of the and uh, confidentiality of the exchanges that are taking place. There's there's no doubt that that's important and needs to be, uh, in fact, emphasized increasingly uh, to say nothing of digital signatures to uh, authenticate origins and integrity of the you know, bit integrity of the content. So uh, I'm going to here's the follow up from uh, from Esther. Uh, this is specific to the Internet Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers, um, where you helped uh, get that organization uh, spun up and funded and were chair for, for many years. Um, Esther's question is, um, what do you see as the greatest success and the greatest failure of ICON? Well, uh, first of all, Esther was the first chair. Uh, and I was present at the board meeting where she was elected chair and uh, and she served the organization well for the time that she served in that position. I succeeded her uh, in the early 2000s. So the I would say that the, the greatest success is it still exists. It, it has extracted itself from government oversight, which was a thorn in the side of most other countries other than the U.S., uh, and the internet continues to work. The domain name system works. The you know the, uh, the IP address allocation system works. Uh, now the uh, if it I wouldn't call it a failure exactly, but I will say that it is a barnacle encrusted institution. Uh, the the solution for almost everything is to create a new committee or a new support organization or some new procedure or what have you. Uh, it it is a very complex and uh, and in some cases confusing. Uh, system. Uh, and But in spite of all that, uh, it is, I think, quite astonishing that the internet continues to function in spite of the evolution, which has grown by, on almost all dimensions, by about seven orders of magnitude. This The system is 10 million times bigger than it was uh, when it was first turned on in 1983, in almost all dimensions, number of computers, number of users, the bandwidth that's available in the optical fiber networks and so on. So um, it has survived and we need to give it credit for that. On the other hand, um, already alluded to some of the um, challenges that we see in this online environment, uh, socioeconomic challenges in particular, political challenges. Uh, ICANN is not the place to solve any of that. It is not a content uh, focused organization should not be, in my opinion. It's there to make sure that the basic naming and uh, addressing infrastructure 
works to assure that the names and the addresses are uniquely assigned. But the application space is is outside of its purview, right? Um, and uh, and it, and it should resist uh, being drawn into uh, that side. It's already complicated enough as it is. Yeah. A reminder to those uh, on the um, stream: you can put um, questions into the chat while Vint uh, speaks Russian to another politician. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> By the way, I'm going to ask you to do your Freud bit later. Uh, yes, I'll do that. Okay. Uh, um, but uh, we have a question from Gentry Lane. Um, State-sponsored persistent cyber aggression on civilian infrastructure is rendering cyberspace untenable and threatens the continuity of critical goods and services. Is cyber conflict an intrinsic component of the internet? Uh, so I think the answer is not that it's an intrinsic component of the internet, it is an intrinsic component of human society. Uh, you know, we, we will find new battlefields, and at this point, the internet and the World Wide Web represent a new battlefield where conflict can occur. And it, it occurs uh, between nation states, it occurs between you know, interested parties, criminal elements, and, and the rest of society. Uh, it is a, a place in which competition takes place among various corporate entities. So it is, it really is another space uh, in which uh, this kind of conflict can occur. I mean, we have air, land, sea, and now we have this virtual environment. Uh, and that, of course, is a challenge because we would like, I think I would like anyway, to make it less likely that that space is uh, harmful uh, to uh, to be in. And in order for that to be a true statement, well, we need to have international agreement and cooperation about what's acceptable and what is not acceptable behavior online. Uh, and speaking even more broadly, forget about the online nature of the internet, the software world is enormous. And even without networking, we still rely unbelievably heavily on programmable things. And when you think about your mobile, for instance, uh, we use it, uh, those of us who have them, and that's a significant fraction of the world's population, rely on them for an amazing number of things. And you get cascade failures that can happen. Right? When, if I'm going to log in to a service online, sometimes I'm going to need to log into my mobile in order to get a second uh, password or a, or a second authenticator from the site that's serving me. So I've used my username and password and it says, well, I don't trust that. So I'm sending you something on your mobile. If you can't log into your mobile or if you get logged into the mobile, but it doesn't have service, then that's not gonna work. Right. And then, so then you can't log into your email. If you can't get logged into your email, then you can't get the message that's gonna save your company from going bankrupt. And, you know, that's sort of an extreme cascade failure. But I, I'm nervous that we rely so heavily on these things. I would really, frankly, wish that uh, other devices besides the mobile could be used to uh, satisfy these various functions. So my laptop and my desktop or my uh, you know, pad or something uh, could be an alternative to the mobile for a lot of these functions. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm curious if you could wave a wand and, and implement one global rule to make the internet better to, or perhaps to govern AI in a way that you think would be uh, beneficial. You, how would you use that one wish? Well, uh, I'm not sure that I can boil it down to, uh, you know, using Harry Potter's wand to make the world better. <laughs> uh, let me, let me suggest uh, this is controversial, and, and it would be interesting to see if anyone wants to uh, joust on the topic. But I have become increasingly persuaded that anonymity is not our friend in this online world. Uh, it is useful and important under certain conditions, but I believe that uh, accountability is becoming an increasingly uh, important element uh, in this space. And that, that parties who are misbehaving in particular need to become accountable. And in order for that to happen, we have to be able to identify them. We may have to get help across international boundaries because a perpetrator could be in one jurisdiction and the victim in another. None of this is easy. 
Uh, I mentioned right. earlier, the Cybercrime Treaty is a very complex piece of, of uh, agreement and it's right now fraught with you know, debate. But we do need to have cooperation and collaboration across willing, uh, between willing parties in order to hold parties accountable. Now, some people would legitimately say, but what about whistleblowers? And I would say, yes, that's an issue. But I don't think that in most whistleblower scenarios, the party who's receiving the blown whistle uh, often needs to know who the party is, uh, but is obligated to keep that party's identity uh, private or right. confidential. So we know of reporters, for example, who have gone to jail protecting their sources uh, because that's, that is an ethic which is very common in high quality journalism. Uh, so I think uh, in that particular case, the party to whom the whistle was blown may need to know who that party is and there to add validity to the report that's coming. So I think uh, off, uh, off, uh, sorry, um, identity and uh, accountability are very much uh, combined together. Uh, I also think, though, that there is an agency element to all this. Uh, in addition to holding parties accountable, we have to give the users of the system, whether it's people or companies or countries, uh, agency to protect themselves. So we need to give them tools like two-factor authentication, like end-to-end uh, -end encryption, uh, and other kinds of mechanisms uh, in order to make it safer and more reliable. So uh, redundancy, more backup capability, all kinds of things like that yeah. need to be a part of this environment in order to improve the safety and security of, of the system that we're increasingly depending on. Are there any governance models that are emerging right now that, that, that you see? For example, there are some pretty robust ones coming out of the EU. Uh, around artificial intelligence that, that concern you? And if so, why? Well, uh, you know, the, uh, you picked the, the EU and, uh, and artificial intelligence, which is a, a toxic mix. Uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, my view of, of the EU, with, with no disrespect intended, is that they tend to look at new environments, new technologies, and they say something bad might happen, we have to regulate it. In, the, in America, it's a little different. It's sort of like something bad has happened. We need to regulate it. Uh, so the, the Europeans tend to get out in front. <clears throat> and in some cases, that's arguably a useful thing, uh, like the uh, general uh, data protection rules. Although it's my view that those general data protection rules <clears throat> have run afoul of law enforcement because law enforcement needs to know and the data protection rules say, no, you don't. And so you often end up with these peculiar conflicting regimes that, uh, that somehow need to be resolved. So uh, I think trying to regulate, literally regulate artificial intelligence or machine learning or, or large language models is premature because I don't think we understand well enough what the rules should be to constrain their misbehavior. That's why earlier I was arguing that we should look at the applications and say whether or not the parties offering applications based on those technologies should show evidence of safety for the consumers of those uh, applications when they're in the high risk space. Now that might imply, as I think you said, that, that the party offering those services should be ready to assume some liability in the event that the high risk thing uh, causes harm. Yeah, yeah. Well, as long as we're talking about potential harm, um, I'll, I'll, I'll raise Adam Sullivan's question, which has been hanging out in the chat for a minute, which is uh, related to artificial intelligence, generalized artificial intelligence. The question is, how close are we to the singularity? Uh, well, it depends on who you ask. Uh, and of course, uh, my, my colleague uh, at Google would tell you that uh, the singularity is nearer. In fact, his latest book uh, is titled that. Uh, his original book was uh, The Singularity is Near. Uh, now, um, it, he's saying, his most recent book is The Singularity is Nearer. He makes a very, very potent is argument. Ray? Uh, yes, is, uh, Ray Kurzweil. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I should have said that. Um, so uh, his latest book, which I read recently, uh, is pretty persuasive. I, I will say that um, the, the metric by which we 
might understand where we are in terms of singularity is not just the number of uh, components in the system, it's the connectivity. The, the brain doesn't work very well without extraordinary connectivity. I mean, some nerves have 10,000 interconnects with other nerves. Uh, and uh, so we don't fully understand all that yet. So I don't think that we are quite as close to the singularity uh, as I would imagine it. However, what we have seen with the large language models is the capacity to do stuff that we would not have imagined these systems could do. Uh, even if they are faulty at it, they are still doing pretty remarkable things. So the Turing test, as it was previously uh, uh, formulated by Turing, uh, is no longer a very useful uh, test. In fact, I would uh, suggest uh, for your consideration that the fact that a large language model can pass the written bar exam or pass the, um, what's the other one, the, the, the bar, oh, the medical exams, does not make a bot a doctor or a lawyer. Right. And so the, this verisimilitude of human discourse that comes out of the large language models should not be misunderstood as capacity to act in these <clears throat> special professions. And so we now need, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> we now need um, different and better metrics for assessing the capability of these kinds of uh, large language models or, or whatever comes from that. I, I think some people, including me, believe that the large language model formulation is inadequate to doing things that you and I would agree are uh, comparable to, uh, to human uh, conduct. It can do things that we can't do. For example, it can handle 100 languages. Right. And it can do so with a certain degree of reliability. Very few human beings could do that. And there are a number of other things that, that these large language models are capable of doing at scale that you and I can't do. But it's, that, that does not mean that it can do some of the things like being a doctor or being a lawyer or some other professional. Right, right. Um, as we uh, sort of round in the last few minutes here of the hour, um, I, I do want to maybe cast our eye forward a bit. Uh, there's a question from Jay Allen in the audience. Uh, you briefly touched on quantum computing, uh, but uh, Jay Allen asks, what will the eventual effect of quantum computing uh, what might it be on the internet? Will the positive effects outweigh possible negative ones? Well, first of all, I'm very excited about quantum computing. And of course, Google has made con considerable investment in designing and building uh, this particular kind of computing engine. They are best at certain classes of problems like optimization. Uh, and without getting into a lot of the details, there is one thing that it can do is well known, and that's the Shor's algorithm that lets it break factorization. And the reason that's important is that our current uh, cryptographic mechanisms have historically used the difficulty of factoring the products of large primes uh, as the work factor uh, protecting uh, encrypted information. Now, we can keep increasing the keys to uh, defend against a quantum attack, but eventually that won't work. And so the National Institutes of Standards and Technology have already invited propositions for uh, new encrypting algorithms and digital signature algorithms that do not suffer from the possibility of a, a Shor's quantum attack. And those are already being adopted at Google, for example, in order to protect information now that may need to be protected for the next 25 years. So I'm very excited about quantum computing. In some ways, the analogy I would use is that if you remember VisiCalc on the Apple IIe or the Apple II Plus, which meant you could do real-time expo exploration of the spreadsheet, plug in different values, see what happens in real time. Uh, I think quantum computing will allow us to explore solution spaces in real time. So we can crawl around looking at optimum uh, solutions of complex problems uh, using quantum computing. And that will be as exciting as it was to do real-time spreadsheets, for example. What do you think the time, uh, how do we think about time going forward then i mean we, we in this conversation we we've, we've dated ourselves to the 1950s and you know 35 years later you said the commercial internet started to become pretty apparent to you at a conference in the late 1980s and then roughly five ten years later the world wide web and 
and and then another 30 years here we are you know is that the time frame that we should be thinking about going forward or things going to look very different in in a shorter time i wish that i had you know a really a clear crystal ball um i don't i will say though that uh, from what i have seen uh quantum computing uh, is already available in some measure. IBM has a, uh, a commercial offering already. Uh, I don't quite know when ours will become available in literally, but I've seen scenarios that make five years very believable and maybe even less than that. So, uh, so I see that scaling. Uh, the big challenge there, by the way, is uh, error correction. Mm -hmm. The ability to have a large number of uh, physical qubits that emulate a logical one so that the computation can continue even while the entanglement is starting to get weak. Uh, you use the physical multiple uh, qubits in order to constitute a reliable logical qubit, but it could take a million physical qubits to model a thousand logical ones. So I think that's relatively near term. We will see applications. But then I'm actually asking when you think about how different the, the overall internet space is and its impact on society from, you know, its emergence in the late 80s, early 1990s to now, how, how long will it be before it's as different uh, in the future as it is from, say, 25, 30 years ago? Will it be no. another 25, 30 years or do you think things are going no, to no, I think so rapidly? much closer. I think that the uh, Internet of Things, which where, where we put computing capability and communications capability into devices that surround us, uh, I think that's already here in many respects and it's coming uh, fast. Uh, that does raise all kinds of questions about how brittle is that technology? How dependent is it on the network? What if the network doesn't work? Uh, you know, will we, will we have, oh, there's a great book that everybody should read. Uh, it's a short novella by E.M. Forster, the title of which is The Machine Stops. It's written yeah, in 1909. Novella, yeah. it, it describes a society that looks a lot like ours did during the pandemic. Everybody is at home, food gets delivered, uh, we communicate online, we never see each other face to face. <laughs> and in the opening scenario of the novel, The Machine Stops Working, and the question is what happens to that society? So we have the risk of, uh, of that possibility, I think, of becoming very dependent on these systems and having them not uh, resilient enough. Uh, and uh, of course, then there's always the, uh, the catastrophic uh, case is the one where uh, we have uh, a, the sun uh, has a, a coronal mass expulsion which reaches the earth and wipes out all of the electronics uh, on the planet. The, the power system gets wiped out, all of the electronics get wiped out, gets wiped out, and we are back to even before the invention of the telegraph and the telephone. Well, now we're describing many of the of the main you know plot features of of, of the largest blockbuster science fiction movies. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, and we are at the top of the hour and I, I, I want to honor everybody's time commitment that, that they've made for the hour and especially yours, Vint. So I want to thank you very much for joining us and the Burn Center and Northeastern in this conversation. It's been lovely. Well, I wonder if, if we'll, uh, we can uh, ask everybody to indulge me with one more observation. Uh, you and I talked about this, but yeah. we're all worried about artificial intelligence and everything else. And so I, I've been pretending to be Sigmund Freud. <laughs> what, what we have now is the artificial id and the artificial ego. And what we are missing now is the artificial superego to control the uncontrollable impulses of the artificial id. <laughs> Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Uh, so, so I think that we will be coping uh, with these phenomena uh, over the next decade or so. Uh, yeah. I could not imagine a more exciting time when technology is taking us for a new ride. Me too. Uh, absolutely. Vint, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to everybody. Uh, and uh, appreciate all your questions. Sorry we couldn't get to every one of them. And don't forget to sign up for all of the lecture series uh, that the Burn Center in Northeastern has uh, uh, available to you. All of that in the chat and on the Burn Center website. Again, thank you very much. See you on the net, John. See you there.